Good morning everyone. My name is Dr. Amit. I am Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Hansraj College. Uh, today's topic is aerobic respiration at the cellular level. So I will be talking about the aerobic respiration at the cell level, how the food that we intake and the oxygen that we take through the respiration both combine and give us the energy. So I will be talking about the aerobic respiration with context to different topics and these are the glycolysis. Then we will be talking about the Krebs cycle, then the shuttle systems and at last we will be talking about the oxidative phosphorylation via ETC that is electron transport chain. So first we will talk about the overall, overall view of the cellular respiration that is the aerobic respiration. So basically whatever food that we intake in our body basically contains three type of biomolecules that is the amino acids, fatty acids and glucose. So these are the main uh, biomolecules which are present in the food that we intake. So these biomolecules enter the cell in the form of acetyl coenzyme A or they enter directly, uh, the glucose enters the cell, it is converted into acetyl coenzyme A via the process which is called as glycolysis, that is breakdown of the glucose. Now, so this is the main pathway where most of the carbon skeleton is present in the form of glucose. The rest amino acids and fatty acids are also broken down into the acetyl coenzyme A and then they undergo citric acid cycle where the acetyl coenzyme A combined with the citrate and they, then in a sequence of uh, chemical reactions CO2 is produced along with that uh, different energy forms that is NADH and FADH2, GTP or ATP are also produced. So NADH and FADH2 here are the reduced electron carriers which contain the electrons up to the electron transport chain. In the last step, all the energy which is produced in the form of NADH along with the FADH2 enters the electron transport chain and then the ATP is produced. So, uh, so this is the overall view of the cellular respiration. So we will be taking each, each one starting from the glycolysis, then the citric acid cycle and last we will be taking the electron transport chain. So if we talk about the glycolysis, so glycolysis is uh, the process in which a molecule of glucose is degraded in a series of enzyme catalyzed reactions which yields two molecules of the three carbon compound pyruvate. So basically glucose which is a six carbon compound is broken down into three carbon compound that is pyruvate. So the two molecules of three carbon compound pyruvate are produced from the one molecule of glucose. And during the sequential reaction of the glycolysis, some of the free energy released from the glucose is conserved in the form of ATP and NADH. Now, glycolysis is an almost universal central pathway of the glucose metabolism. So this pathway has the largest flux of the carbon in most of the cells. That is why, first of all, we are taking the glycolysis. So if we talk about the different phases of the glycolysis, so there are two phases of glycolysis, preparatory phase and the payoff phase. So in the preparatory phase, 6 carbon compound is first broken down into 3 carbon compound, glyceraldehyl 3 phosphate and then the 2 molecules of glyceraldehyl 3 phosphate further enters the payoff phase where the energy is generated in the form of ATP or NADH. So this is the preparatory phase or the first phase of the glycolysis in which as we can see this is the glucose molecule. So as it enters the glycolysis in the first reaction glucose is converted into glucose 6-phosphate and the enzyme which is acting is the hexokinase. So in the presence of the hexokinase, glucose is converted into glucose 6-phosphate. That means at the 6th position of the glucose, phosphate is attached. So this is glucose 6-phosphate. Here, one ATP is utilized, so ATP is converted into ADP and the phosphate released from the ATP is attached at the 6th carbon position of the glucose. That's why it is called as glucose 6-phosphate. Now, uh, you must notice that this particular reaction is irreversible reaction. Rest of the reactions except the few are the reversible. So, I'll be along with the cycle, along with the pathway, I'll be mentioning the irreversible reactions. Now, this glucose 6-phosphate is further converted into its isomer which is the fructose 6-phosphate. And the enzyme used is phosphohexose isomerase. So, in the presence of this enzyme, glucose 6-phosphate is converted into fructose 6-phosphate. Now this fructose 6-phosphate further converts into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That means in the fructose molecule, the phosphate group is attached at the first carbon as well as at the sixth carbon as well. So the molecule called is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. 
this is also again irreversible reaction here also the second phosphate is added from the ATP so one ATP is utilized ADP is released and this phosphate is attached as the sixth position in the fructose molecule next reaction is the conversion of fructose 1 6 bisphosphate into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxy acetone phosphate so basically here as you can see the blue and the another color so this particular molecule is the fructose 1 6 bisphosphate so half of the molecule will be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate another half will be converted into dihydroxy acetone phosphate now these two molecules are three carbon compounds which are coming from the six carbon fructose 1 6 bisphosphate molecule now the enzyme here is the aldolase so in presence of the aldolase the six carbon compound is converting into three carbon compound this is glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxy phosphate in the last reaction of the preparatory phase which is the fifth reaction in this this dihydroxy acetone is again converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and this is the irreversible reaction so in this we will get two molecule of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and the enzyme used is triose phosphate isomerase so this is called the preparatory phase so we started with the glucose molecules which is a six carbon molecule and we ended up with the glyceraldehyde 3 molecule which is a three carbon compound now uh, then uh, the cycle enters the pa uh, payoff phase so in this particular phase oxidative conversion of the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate occurs into pyruvate which is uh, again three carbon compound and it is coupled with the production of the ATP and NADH so in the payoff phase basically energy is produced in the form of ATP or NADH now the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecule which, which are the two molecules which we get from the six carbon compound that is the glucose in the preparatory phase will undergo the breakdown into the 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate molecule it will convert into 1,3 uh, bisphosphoglycerate molecule in the presence of the enzyme which is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase so here two NAD plus are being used to produce two NADH and the molecule produces 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate another thing which is uh, that we have to keep in mind in the payoff phase is that we got two molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate from one molecule of glucose in the preparatory phase so here all the steps will have two molecules okay so the NADS produced or the any kind of energy produced is also doubled and all the molecules produced are also doubled so here you can see the two which is written in front of each and every molecule next reaction now one uh, one three bisphosphoglycerate this particular uh, molecule will be converted into 3 phosphoglycerate okay so here we can see on the uh, bisphosphoglycerate so two molecule of phosphate are attached now one is so one molecule of phosphate will be taken up by ADP and it will be converted into ATP and there will be only one phosphate molecule so it will be now called as 3 phosphoglycerate this is the step which is also called as substrate level phosphorylation so basically phosphorylation of ADP directly from the substrate that is why we are calling it as substrate level phosphorylation or substrate level ATP synthesis so again here two molecules of ATP are synthesized further this 3 phosphoglycerate will undergo mutation and it will be converted into 2 phosphoglycerate in the presence of the enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase now this 2 phosphoglycerate will further undergo and it will convert into phosphoenol pyruvate PEP in the presence of the enzyme that is enolase at the last step which is again irreversible step in the presence of the enzyme pyruvate kinase phosphoenol pyruvate will be converted into two molecule of pyruvate here this is again the example of substrate level phosphorylation where the ATP is formed by using the phosphate uh, group from the substrate directly and the ADP along with the phosphate combines to form two molecule of ATP again so in the payoff phase what we saw is the production of total of four ATP and two NADH but as we already know two ATP we have already consumed in the preparatory phase so the net production is the two ATP and two NADH now if we talk about any uh, biochemical or the metabolic pathway so it must be regulated at different levels so without the regulation no pathway 
works in the metabolic process. So if we talk about the regulation of the uh, glycolysis, so basically uh, we studied three basic steps which were irreversible. First was the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate by the presence of the enzyme hexokinase. Another one was the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1, PFK1. And the last was the, uh, at the conversion of phosphoenol pyruvate, PEP, into pyruvate and the enzyme used was the uh, pyruvate kinase. So these three steps were irreversible and these three enzymes are very crucial. So the regulation of the glycolysis o uh, o at the overall, overall level will be done at these three levels or by regulating these three enzymes. So if we talk about the hexokinase, so hexokinase 4 basically, so this is basically regulated by the nuclear protein. So its regulatory protein is a nuclear protein. So uh, basically uh, the concentration of the hexokinase which converts glucose into glucose 6-phosphate depends on the concentration of the glucose which is present in the blood capillaries. So for example, if the glucose concentration increases in the blood capillaries, so this particular hexokinase 4 is present in the liver. So as the glucose concentration increases, it is taken up by the GLUT2 transporter, it enters the liver and it enhances the dissociation of the hexokinase 4 from the regulator protein. So as the hexokinase 4 dissociates from the regulator protein, it enters the cytoplasm and from the nucleus it comes to the cytoplasm and in the cytoplasm it converts glucose into glucose 6-phosphate and further into fructose 6-phosphate. In case, if the fructose 6-phosphate concentration increases, it reverses the process. So as the fructose 6 concentration increases, here the green triangle is showing the regulation in the positive manner. So hexokinase 4 again enters the nucleus and it combines with the regulatory protein and its function is masked. That's how the concentration or the activation of the hexokinase 4 enzyme is regulated with reference to the concentration of the glucose into the blood capillaries. Second enzyme that we studied was the phosphofructokinase 1. So as we can see from this, Phosphofructokinase 1 or PFK1 basically converts fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate in the presence of ATP. So there are different molecules which will be enhancing the particular reaction or enhancing or regu uh, positively regulating and few will be negatively regulating. So for example, AMP and ADP which are showing with the green triangle. So these particular molecules will act as a positive regulator for the PFK1. Same with the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate molecule. So the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate molecule will also give the positive regulation to the PFK1 regulation. While uh, the opposite will be done with the help of ATP or the citrate. So for example, if the ATP concentration has been increased or the citrate concentration increases, so it will uh, give the negative regulation to the PFK1 and this conversion of glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate will be halted. Now coming to the third enzyme which is at the tenth step or the last step where the phosphonyl pyruvate is converted into pyruvate. So the enzyme uh, used is pyruvate kinase. Now pyruvate kinase is basically has two forms active and the inactive form. So the active form is without the phosphorylation and the inactive form is by using the phosphorylation. So once the pyruvate kinase enzyme is phosphorylated, it becomes inactive okay, in the liver cell. So uh, when we need to convert PEP into the pyruvate, dephosphorylation occurs by using the H2O and inorganic phosphate is removed and that's how it is dephosphorylated and this is the active pyruvate kinase. It acts on the PEP and it converts it into the pyruvate which is the last step. And in this process, one ATP is again synthesized. If we talk about the reverse process, if we don't want to convert PEP into the pyruvate or for example, pyruvate concentration or the alanine concentration has already increased, so the reverse process will occur. Now this pyruvate kinase will be phosphorylated by the help of glucagon and one ATP will be used. So due to the phosphorylation of the pyruvate kinase, now it converts into the inactive form and that's how we regulate the conversion of PEP into the pyruvate with the help of pyruvate kinase enzyme. So this is the first step of the aerobic respiration that, cover, that we cover the glycolysis. 
Now, uh, this was the one main type of sugar that, uh, that we used or that we daily use in our intake in the food. There are another different type of uh, carbohydrates or the sugars which are present in our body that we intake in the food. So, these are uh, trihalose or lactose or sucrose or fructose or a stored form of the uh, carbohydrate which is the glycosin or the starch in uh, or uh, degalactose or demenose. So these are also different type of uh, sugars that we intake in our food. So these or uh, these all are interlinked to each other, and they are coming and uh, ending at the glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecule. So for example, if we talk about the sucrose, which contains the D-glucose and the fructose. Now further, this fructose is converted into fructose one phosphate by fructokinase, and this fructose one phosphate is further converted converted into glyceraldehyde and dihydroxy acetone phosphate which is which are the three carbon molecules now this glyceraldehyde and dihydroxy acetone are further converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate so this is again the last step of the uh, preparatory phase of the glycolysis and from here the payo phase starts and it ends in the pyruvic acid similarly d glucose which is converted to glucose 6 phosphate and glucose 6 phosphate is again converted to fructose 1 6 bis phosphate via fructose 6-phosphate and it is again ending up into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this is again coming to the 3-carbon molecule which is the last step of the preparatory phase of the glycolysis. Similarly, D-galactose and D-menose are again coming and joining at the step of the fructose 6-phosphate or glucose 1-phosphate and they are again ending up into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. That's how uh, other sugars also which are part of our diet coming around a part into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and then it is entering into the glycolysis process. Now once the uh, pyruvic acid or the pyruvate is formed from the glucose molecule, it may have different fates on the presence of the oxygen or in the absence of the oxygen. So based on the type of respiration, either it is anaerobic or uh, it is aerobic, pyruvate may have different fates. And that also depends in the type of organism. So, for example, if the oxygen is absent, that means the respiration is anaerobic. In that case, in case of yeast, it may lead to the fermentation to ethanol and it will also produce CO2. In the hypoxic condition, in the absence of oxygen or anaerobic condition. Similarly, again in the anaerobic condition, in case of the contracting muscle fibers or in erythrocytes or in some other cells, it may convert into lactate or the lactic acid. So these are the fates in the absence of the oxygen. In the higher organisms, animals, plants and the many microbes, in the aerobic respiration, that means we are using oxygen as part of our breathing or the respiration. So the pyruvate is being converted into acetyl coenzyme A. Okay? And so pyruvate is converted into first into acetyl coenzyme A and as we already know acetyl coenzyme A is the substrate for the citric acid cycle. So this produced acetyl coenzyme A enters the citric acid cycle and again it forms the NADH and ATP which is the energy form and it also produces the CO2. And then all the energy form which is present in the form of NADH or FADH2 finally enters the ETC. So first we will see the uh, conversion of pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A and then acetyl coenzyme A will be further entering into the citric acid cycle. So if we talk about the production of the acetyl coenzyme A, so before entering the citric acid cycle, the carbon skeleton of the sugars, so the fatty acids are degraded to the acetyl group of the acetyl coenzyme A, the form in which the cycle accepts most of its fuel input. So citric acid cycle takes its input in the form of acetyl coenzyme A, that is why we are converting glucose, so that is pyruvate that we got from the glucose uh, breakdown by glycolysis into the acetyl coenzyme A. Now this overall reaction basically contains pyruvate dehydrogenase complex enzyme, it is a complex of different subunits of the enzyme and it undergoes oxidative decarboxylation process and irreversible oxidation process in which carboxyl group is removed from the pyruvate okay as a molecule of co2 and the two remaining carbon becomes the acetyl group of the acetyl coenzyme a so basically this shaded area which contains this uh, coo group 
is being removed in the form of CO2. The rest two carbon are combining with the coenzyme A with the help of the thiol group and it is forming the acetyl coenzyme A. So, here the pyruvate is being converted into acetyl coenzyme A. The enzyme used is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which is a complex of the different subunit of the enzyme, and these subunits are E1, E2, and E3. There are different type of cofactors which are being used along with this particular enzyme to, en to enhance the efficiency and to carry out the reaction. And these are TPP, that is thiamine pyrophosphate, FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide, NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, COASH, which is the coenzyme A along with the thiol group, and the li lipolate, which is the lipoic acid. So these are the five cofactors which are being used along with the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to carry out or to convert pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A. Now this acetyl coenzyme A is ready to enter the citric acid cycle. So citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. So basically the Krebs cycle, the name is given after its uh, discovery which was discovered by Hans Krebs. So, citric acid cycle is a nearly universal central catabolic pathway in which the compound derived from the breakdown of the carbohydrates, fats and the proteins are oxidized to CO2 with most of the energy oxidation temporarily held in the electron carriers which are FADH2 and the NADH2. So, basically what happens the food that we intake it may contain the carbohydrate, it may contain the fat and the protein. First, it is converted into acetyl coenzyme A, which is the accepted form of the these carbohydrate, fat and proteins or the diet which enters the citric acid cycle. Now, these are oxidized into CO2 molecule. Along with that, energy is trapped temporarily in the electron carriers, which are FADH2 and NADH. Now acetyl coenzyme A enters the citric acid cycle. So in case, uh, so the location of the citric acid cycle differs in the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes. So for example, in eukaryotes it is occurring in the mitochondria, while in prokaryotes it is occurring into the cytosol. So the acetyl coenzyme A enters the citric acid cycle. It combines with the citrate, and it the synthase catalyzes its condensation with the oxaloacetate to form citrate. Okay. So basically acetyl coenzyme A combines with the oxaloacetate in the presence of citrate synthase enzyme and is converted into citrate. Now in continuity with that in the seven sequential reactions which also includes two decarboxylation that means CO2 is produced at two steps citric acid cycle converts citrate into the oxaloacetate and two CO2 are released. Now, for each acetyl coenzyme A, which is oxidized by the citric acid cycle, energy gain consists of three molecules of NADH, one molecule of FADH2, and one ATP or GTP. So, this is the overall citric acid cycle. As we can see, acetyl coenzyme A, which is entering the cycle, it is combining with the Basically, it is undergoing the condensation, it is combining with the oxaloacetate in the presence of citrate synthase and it is forming citrate. Now, citrate is ag again undergoing a dehydration and it is forming an intermediate compound which is called as cis aconitase. Now, cis aconitase is again converted into isocitrate. This isocitrate then undergoes oxidative decarboxylation and it is being converted into alpha keto glutarate and one molecule of NADH is produced. Again, this alpha keto glutarate in the presence of alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase complex is converted into succinyl coenzyme A and again one NADH is produced. Now, this succinyl coenzyme A is converted into succinate and one GTP or ATP is produced and this is again a substrate level phosphorylation reaction where the phosphate group for the formation of the ATP is being taken directly from the substrate which is the succinyl coenzyme A. Now, further the succinate is being converted into the fumarate and here also the energy form which is released is FADS2. The fumarate is converted into malate in the presence of the enzyme which is 
fumarase. Now malate is converted into oxalic acid by dehydrogenation and again one NADH is produced in the presence of the enzyme malate dehydrogenase and now this oxalic acid is again available for the combining to the acetyl coenzyme A and the cycle repeats again. So from this overall reaction of the citric acid cycle what we got is a three NADH molecules one FADS2 molecule and one GTP or ADP molecule. So these are the different forms of the energy that we got. Along with that, two molecules of CO2 are also produced. Now, if we talk about the regulation of the citric acid cycle, so there are different molecules. So if it is showing the cross in the red color, that means these are inhibiting or these are putting the negative regulation and which are showing in the a green triangle so these molecules are enhancing the particular reaction or which are putting the positive regulation so pyruvate is first converted into acetyl coenzyme a. so these are the molecules as atp acetyl coenzyme a, nadh or fatty acid so these are inhibiting this reaction while amp coenzyme a nad plus and calcium ions are enhancing this particular reaction now this acetyl coenzyme a that we got from the pyruvate enters the citric acid cycle and during the conversion of the acetyl coenzyme into citrate, ADP enhances the reaction while NADH, succinyl coenzyme A, citrate and ATP inhibits the reaction. Next reaction uh, where we can regulate this cycle is the conversion of isocitrate into alpha ketoglutrate where ATP is inhibiting this reaction, calcium ions and ADP are enhancing this reaction. Next is conversion of keto alpha ketoglutrate into the succinyl coenzyme A, where succinyl coenzyme A and NADH are inhibiting this reaction, calcium ion is enhancing this particular reaction. And if we talk about the overall energy production that we already talked, so this is basically production of one NADH, second NADH and third NADH, one molecule of FADH2 and one molecule of GTP or ATP. So uh, this was a breakthrough discovery. So Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1953 was awarded to Hans Crab for his discovery of the citric acid cycle. And this particular Nobel Prize was shared by another scientist, Fritz Lippmann, for his discovery of the coenzyme A and its importance for intermediary metabolism. If we talk about the stereochemistry of the coenzyme reactions, that how many uh, ATP, how many NADH and how many FADS2 are being produced at different steps starting from the glycolysis and uh, then the uh, acetyl coenzyme A formation and then the citric acid cycle. So starting from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, one ATP is being used in the preparatory phase. So this is minus one. Then fructose 6-phosphate is being converted into fructose 1,6-bix-phosphate. So again one ATP is used. So two ATP are consumed in the preparatory phase of the glycolysis. Now in the second phase which is the payoff phase, two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are converted into two molecules of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and here two NADH are being produced. Then in the next step, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, EB is converted into 3-phosphoglycerate and two ATP are produced. Then PEP is being converted into pyruvate at the last step of the glycolysis and the last step 2 ATP are again produced. If you talk about the link reaction where the pyruvate is being converted into acetyl coenzyme A, here also 2 NADH are produced. Then if you talk about the citric acid cycle, so during the conversion of isocitrate to alpha ketoglutrate, 2 NADH are produced and the conversion of succinyl coenzyme A to succinate, again 2 NADH are produced. Then, during the conversion of succinate to fumarate, again two FADS2 are produced, and during the conversion of malate to oxaloacetate, two NADH are produced. So, in total, if we count the number of ATP by conversion of the ATP into uh, the conversion of the NADH and FADS2 into ATP, we got a total of 30 to 32 ATP. Now, as we can see from this table, during the conversion of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, two NADH are produced, which are showing either the production of three molecules of ATP or the production of the five molecules of ATP. 
So basically the difference of the two molecule, so this has been also reflected in the totality that is production of the 30 or 32 molecule. So there is a gap of two molecule of ATP and that is because of the, it depending on the difference in the mechanism that is being used to shuttle NADS equivalent from the cytosol to the mitochondrial matrix. So as we know glycolysis is occurring in the cytoplasm or the cytosol while citric acid cycle along with the ETC or the respiratory chain is present in the mitochondria of the eukaryotic cell. Now all these ATP which are produced from the glycolysis they must enter inside the mitochondria so that the NADH or FADH2 can be converted into the ATP through ATC. So during the entry of the uh, NADH and FADH2 as we know that the inner membrane of the mitochondria is impermeable to the NADH and FADH2 so we need to cross the this particular inner membrane of the mitochondria. For that we have two type of shuttle systems basically. One is the mallet aspartate shuttle and second is the second is the glyceride glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. So uh, in case of mallet aspartate shuttle NADH dehydrogenase that is the complex one of the inner mitochondrial membrane of the ETC of the animal cell can only accept electron from the NADH in the matrix. So given that the inner membrane is not permeable to NADH, how can the NADH generated by the glycolysis in the cytosol be reoxidized to NAD by O2 via the respiratory chain? So this is possible because of the presence of the mallet aspartate shuttle. So the special shuttle system carry reducing equivalent from cytosolic NADH into the mitochondria by an indirect route. So the most active NADH sh shuttle known which occurs in the liver, kidney and the heart mitochondria is the malate aspartate shuttle. So this is the inner mitochondrial membrane, this is the intermembrane space and this is the matrix. So here as we can see malate is formed from the oxaloacetate and here one NADH is being converted into NAD+. And this malate is entering the inner membrane of the mitochondria via malate alpha ketoglutarate transporter. Along with that, one molecule of the alpha ketoglutarate is going in the opposite direction through the same transporter. So basically, this is the antiporter where one molecule of malate is being transferred towards the matrix and one molecule of the alpha ketoglutarate is being transferred into the inner membrane space. Now this malate malate again converts into oxaloacetate by using malate dehydrogenase and this NAD plus again converts into NADH. So as we can see this NADH which is present in the intermediate space now is present into the matrix with the help of the malate. Now this oxaloacetate again is converted into aspartate and aspartate again crosses the inner membrane from matrix to the inner membrane space via glutamate aspartate transporter. Now this glutamate aspartate transporter is again also antiporter where one molecule of glutamate again goes in the opposite direction from the intermembrane space into the matrix. Now this aspartate once in comes into the intermembrane space is again converted into oxaloacetate by aspartate amino transferase. Now oxaloacetate is again ready to take up the NADH to be transferred inside the matrix. That's how the NADH molecule are indirectly transferred with the help of malate from the intermembrane space into the matrix via malate alpha ketoglutrate transporter. Now, in case of skeletal muscles or brain, it uses a different NADH shuttle that is the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. It differs from the malate aspartate shuttle in that it delivers the reducing equivalent from NADH to ubiquinone and thus into the complex 3 but not on the complex 1. So providing only enough energy to synthesize 1.5 ATP molecule per pair of electrons. We will see later how these 1.5 ATP molecules are being produced from the 1 FADH2 and how 2.5 ATP are being produced from the NADH molecule. 
Now, because this pathway bypasses the NADH dehydrogenase of the complex 1 and the associated proton movement, so the yield of the ATP from the cytosolic NADH is less than from the NADH generated into the matrix. So this is the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. As we can see from the glycolysis, we got NADH. Now this NADH is being converted into NAD+, along with the conversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glycerol 3 phosphate. And the enzyme being used is cytosolic glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Now, this glycerol, glycerol 3 phosphate is again converted into dihydroxyacetone phosphate by the mitochondrial glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. So, this was the cytosolic enzyme, this is the mitochondrial enzyme through which now these electrons which are taken from the NADS are being used in conversion of FAD to FADS2. So, as we can see from cytosol, it was NADH. But when it enters the cell or it enters the mitochondria of the cell, it is now the FADS2, which then goes to the ubiquinone and further into the complex 3. So one thing that we can notice from this particular uh, shuttle system is that there is absence or there is the bypass of the complex 1. So the NADH basically enters the complex 1 first, while FADS2 enters directly into the ubiquinone and then into the complex 3. Now, uh, once the F NADH and FADS2, both type of the energy forms, once they enter the matrix of the mitochondria of a cell, now they undergo the process which is known as oxidative phosphorylation, where it is the process by which ATP is basically synthesized and it is coupled with the movement of the electrons through the mitochondrial electron transport chain and associated consumption of the oxygen. So basically what occurs is the inner, into the inner membrane of the mitochondria, there are different electron carrier complexes. So these co carrier complexes combine to form the ETC, electron transport chain, which is also known as a respiratory chain. So as these molecules of the uh, NADH and FADS2, which comes in contact with the ETC, these are being ox uh, oxidized, so these are the reducing equivalent in the form of NADH and FADS2. These are oxidized, producing the protons and the electrons. So the protons are being pumped from the this matrix to the inner membrane space of the mitochondria. Along with that, electrons are transported from one complex to the another. Here is the difference in the transport of the electrons by the two different uh, uh, re uh, reducing equivalent that is the NADH and FADS2. So succinate is basically representing the FADS2. So in case of NADH, this is being taken from the complex 1. So NADH is oxidized at the complex 1 site. So at the complex 1, 4 hydrogen ion are being pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space and the two electrons are transported from complex 1 to the ubiquinone. While in case of FADS2, succinate to fumarate conversion or FADS2 to FAD plus conversion, it directly uh, goes from complex 2 to ubiquinone and then complex 3. Complex 2 do not transport any proton from the matrix to the inner membrane space. So there is a bypass of one complex, which is the complex 1. Where, so there is a difference of the 4 hydrogen molecule in uh, conversion or oxidation of the one NADS or FADS2 molecule. Further, these electrons tra are transported from ubiquinone to complex 3. Here again the protons are transported from matrix to the intermembrane space from complex 3 to cytochrome C and cytochrome C to ultimately complex 4. Once the electrons are at the complex 4, so the, uh, the final acceptor of the electrons is the oxygen molecule that the oxygen that we intake by the breathing or the respiration exercise. So these electrons combine with the two hydrogen and half O2 to form H2O. That's how a molecule of water is produced by using the oxygen that we respire along with the electrons which are coming from the reducing agent which is the NADS and the FADS2. Now, so this is basically the electron transport chain where the electron transport is being shown. Now the question comes how the ATP are being produced from the NADS and FADS2. So 
Before going into the detail, we will uh, look into the different type of electron carrier complexes of the ATC. That is the 1, 2, 3 and 4. 1, complex 1 which take up NADH, so called as NADH dehydrogenase. Second is succinate dehydrogenase which take up FADH2. Then ubiquinone cytochrome C oxidoreductase and then cytochrome oxidase. These have different masses in kilodalton. These have different number of subunit which combine to form these complexes and these have the different prosthetic groups which helps in their function. Now to understand the uh, production or the synthesis of the ATP, we will have to first study the chemoosmetic theory which was given by Peter Michel in 1961. So basically this was to study the mechanism of oxidative phosphorylation and to study the production of ATP from NADH and FADH2. So during the transport of electrons from, a, from the reducing equivalent NADH and FADH2, protons are being transported from matrix into the inner membrane space of the mitochondria. So as we know, when the protons will be transported, so here will be the pool of the protons and there will be more positive charge from the outside and negative charge in the inside. D due to the transport of the protons, there is a change in the pH also. So there is a pH gradient. So this is a chemical gradient and there is a electrical gradient, electrochemical gradient. So electrical gradient is the difference in the charge, positive and negative, and the chemical gradient is change in the pH. So these two chemical potential or the chemical gradient and the chemical uh, and the electrical potential combine and because of this combination there is a there is variation or there is a variation in the charge and the pH which leads to the again according to the electrochemical nature these protons must enter the matrix again so, but there is no uh, particular transporter or there is no particular space to enter the protons from the intermembrane space into the matrix as the inner membrane of the mitochondria is impermeable to the protons. So how the protons again or the hydrogen ions again enter the mitochondrial matrix? So they does by the help of the complex 5 for ATP synthase specifically the F0 part of the ATP synthase. So actively these protons enter into the matrix via F0 and during this entry by the rotational catalysis mechanism ATP is synthesized. We will look into the detail of the ATP synthesis further. So basically the chemiosmotic theory says that because of the difference in the pH and the electrical charge the protons which are present in the inner membrane space tries to again enter the cytosol to maintain the electrochemical potential and for that they, and they come through the ATP synthase and that's how the ATP is produced. Now before going into the ATP synthesis and the detail of the ATP synthase complex, we'll first have to study the structure of the ATP synthase or the ATPase complex. So mitochondrial ATP synthase is a F-type ATPase which is similar in structure and mechanism to the ATP synthase of the chloroplast and the U bacteria. Now the large enzyme complex of the inner mitochondrial membrane catalyzes the formation of ATP from the ADP and PI campaigned by the flow of proton from the positive to the negative side of the membrane. Now ATP synthase is also known as complex 5 has two distinct components. One is the F1 which is the peripheral membrane protein. Another is the F0. So not or the O is denoting the oligomycin sensitive which is integral membrane protein. So basically F0 part of the ATP synthase is sensitive to the oligomycin antibiotic. Now this is the structure of the ATP synthase. So it's basically it contains two components F0 and F1. These are the two units and these units further have the subunit. So for example F0 unit of the ATP synthase contains one A subunit, two B subunit, 3 uh, or the 9 to 12 C subunit. So as we can see from this diagram, so 9 to 12 C subunits, 1 A subunit and 2 B subunit, these combine, this yellow part combine to form the F0 part, F0 component of the ATP synthase. While in case of F1, 9 subunit of the 5 different type with the composition alpha 3, beta 3, gamma, delta and epsilon. So these are the alpha 3 and beta 3 in alternate fashion. 
in the center is the road like structure which is the gamma at the base is the epsilon and delta is present at the b2 unit of the f naught that's how these subunit different subunit of the f naught and f1 combine to form the complete atpase complex or atp synthase complex So basically ATP synthesis occurs by the mechanism which is known as rotational catalysis mechanism or also known as flip flop mechanism which was given by Paul Boyer. So what happens is, so this is basically the cytosolic of the inner membrane space and this is the matrix side. So as the concentration of the proton is high in the intermembrane space. So the protons try to enter into the matrix to maintain the electrochemical gradient. And for that, the electrons enter between the A and the C subunit of the F0 uh, unit of the ATPS complex. So in the between the A and C subunit, hydrogen ions or the protons enter into the F0. And from that, this particular C subunit rotates and along with that gamma subunit rotates in between the alpha and beta subunit and into the beta subunit there are different sites that we are going to talk about further these beta subunits contain different sites through which ADP and the inorganic phosphate combine to give out ATP that's how the movement of the protons from the inner membrane space into the matrix leads to the production of the ATP from the ADP and PI by using the beta subunit sites. Now this particular process occurs via the rotational catalysis mechanism. So each beta subunit of the ATP synthase can assume three different conformations. These are O state, L state and the T state. So in the O state as the name suggests, which is the open state, which binds to the ATP, ADP PA weakly. While the L state, which is the loose state, it binds with the ADP and PA loosely, while the T state or the tight state, which binds ADP and PA very tightly and give vows to ADP. So here we can see, so there is a rotation of 120 degree at one time, at one go, and as we can see, these are the three states. This is the open state, or this is the loose state, and this is the tight state. So here ATP is going out, here ADP and PA are, are combined, and here ATP is being formed. So with the rotation of 120 degrees, there is the release of one ATP. So the same state comes into its position after three different uh, 120 degree rotation. So in total of 136, uh, 360 degree rotation, the same state comes at the same position of the beta subunit. So ATP is basically synthesized only in the tight state while released only in the open state. So in the tight state, ATP is first produced and then when the tight state changes into the O state or the open state after the rotation of 120 degree of the gamma subunit, this ATP produced is released. Now rotation of the gamma subunit relative to the fixed alpha 3, beta 3 occurs in discrete 100 degree, 120 degree steps as we already know. And the most widely accepted experimental value for the number of protons required to drive the synthesis of one ATP molecule is four. So for production of one molecule of ATP, at least we need four protons. So for 10 protons, which are being pumped using one NADH, so how we counted the 10 protons? Four from the complex one, then again, four from the complex three and two from the complex four. So total of 10 protons pumped using 1 NADH, 2.5 ATP are synthesized as 4 protons are required for the formation of 1 ATP. Similarly, as in case of FADS2, complex 1 is being bypassed, so 6 protons are total produced from the complex 3 and complex 4. So from these 6 protons, 1.5 ATP is being synthesized. Now we can understand, we can see that the 1 NADS is equivalent to 2.5 ATP, 1 FADS2 is equivalent to 1.5 ATP and the logic behind is the electron transport chain and different electron carrier complexes. So again, uh, the Nobel Prize was given in Physiology and Medicine in 1931 to the scientist Otto Warnberg. Uh, so Otto Warnberg got the Nobel Prize for its discovery for the flavins and the nicotinamide 
what are the active groups of the hydrogen transferring enzymes. So, it was the discovery where the flavins and nicotinamide basically were declared which contained the hydrogen transferring enzyme. It was again the breakthrough discovery and this particular scientist got the Nobel Prize for that in 1931. Now, if we talk about the overall electron transport chain, so the diagram uh, which is showing the red color is the electron transport chain and the blue color is showing the ATP synthase or the complex 5. So, as we can see this is the inner membrane space, this is the mitochondrial matrix and this is the intermembrane space. Now, these are the different electron carrier complexes, complex 1, complex 2, complex 3 and this is the ATP synthase which is complex 5. 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So, NADH, so this is the reducing equivalent. So, NADH is being oxidized into NAD plus hydrogen ions which are produced which are pumped from the matrix into the inner membrane space along with that the electrons are being transferred to the ubiquinone. While in case of FADS2, FADS2 is oxidized to FAD plus and the electrons are being taken from second complex to the ubiquinone and then these are again trans, uh, transferred to the complex 3, more hydrogen ions are being transferred, then cytochrome C and then to complex 4 again more hydrogen are being transported and ultimately these electrons are being taken up by the the uh, last acceptor of the electron over the ultimate acceptor of the electron which is the oxygen. So, the free hydrogen ion, two electrons and the half oxygen combined to form one water molecule. Now, this leads to the increase of the protons into the inner membrane space and these come out through the ATP synthase and because of the rotational mechanism, rotation of the F1, F0 unit of the ATP synthase, ADP in presence of the inorganic phosphate is being converted into the ATP. So, ultimately our purpose is being solved where we started off with the reducing equivalent of the energy that is the NADS and FADS2 and ultimately what we are getting is the ATP which is the ultimate source of the energy. So, uh, this is again showing the electron transport chain, this is the ATP synthase, this is the NADH which is being oxidized. So, this is the oxidation of the NADS to NAD plus. Now, the energy is being used and the hydrogen ions are being pumped through the complex 1. Along with that, two electrons are being transported. Again, the hydrogen ions are pumped from the complex 3. These electrons again go to cyt uh, cytochrome C and then they enter the complex 4. Again, the hydrogen ions are being transported from the matrix into the inner membrane space. And ultimately, through the ATP synthase, these hydrogen ions are again being pumped back to the matrix. Along with the pumping of the hydrogen ions, ADP is being converted into the formation of the ATP, which is the ultimate goal of this electron transport chain. So, if we see the overall uh, conclusion of this particular topic, so we started off with the glu glycolysis, where the glucose intake, this is the dietary intake of the glucose that we eat and along with that we breathe. So, the oxygen that we take for the breathing and the food we take, the both are being used to get the energy. So, the glucose is being converted into the pyruvate with the help of glycolysis, energy is being produced and the reducing equivalent are also being produced. Now, pyruvate is again being converted into acetyl coenzyme A which undergoes Krebs cycle and then again the energy is being produced and reducing equivalent are also being produced. This all the reducing equivalents at last step enters the electron transport chain or the respiratory chain and these are ultimately being converted into the ATP molecule. That's how whatever we eat and uh, the oxygen that we breathe that is being converted into the energy or the energy that we get to work for our da on the daily basis. So this is all which is the process or the biochemical processes which go into the backdrop of it. Isn't it fascinating? So, uh, this is uh, it for today. Thank you so much.